The Rebel Capitalist Show. Can you explain why price signals are so important for a healthy economy to grow? And what I'm getting at is the allocation or the efficient allocation of uh, scarce resources. And uh, once you explain that, I want to take it back to communist Russia and then move it ahead to a central bank digital currency. Okay, sure. So nowadays, I think most economists, particularly those who have a general, you know, uh, favor of the free market or, you know, just market economy, would agree that, oh, yes, prices give us information, they give us feedback, you know, things like that. But it really was the Austrians, I would say, who developed this notion and sort of pushed it out into the broader economics uh, community. Um, Hayek, in particular, did a lot of work on this stuff. So, so yeah, the different way just to summarize it it's we, we there's a lot of decentralized knowledge okay that you know p- people individuals know how factories work somebody in africa a mine collapses and all of a sudden there's less tin available you know or there's new discovery and so there's all kinds of new information coming into people's field of vision but there's billions of us all spread over earth and the question is how do we mobilize that information so that the people making decisions in Albuquerque are aware of what they need to be aware of because it's, it's too much. You can't just give them everything. That's too much information. Right. And so, and so Hayek in particular, you know, we're really, and I, I'll wait, we're probably gonna get the socialist calculation issue. And, you know, Mises was the one who really developed this stuff initially, but the idea is that yet yeah, in practice, the way markets work or one of the things they do is prices guide entrepreneurs. And so ultimately like just consider a business enterprise. What does it mean to be profitable? It's that you're spending less on resources than your customers spend on the things you turn them into. Mm-hmm. And so loosely speaking, it's like you're taking resources of a certain market value, transforming them into things that people want more. That's what it means to be profitable. And so that's how you know that enterprise is contributing on net. Whereas if you're, if you're you know, causing losses, suffering losses, you're taking resources that other entrepreneurs could have put to better uses in their operations. Right. And how do we know that? Because they're bidding up the price. Right. So it's, so that's one way of like knowing, like, so for a given input, like this ounce of gold, should I use it to coat this apartment and make it look pretty? And we say, no, that would be way too expensive. That would be wasteful. <laughs> well, how do we know that? Because of prices. If we didn't have prices, we actually wouldn't know that. You know what I mean? So if things the asset. Right, so that's that's the or to know should we have central air in all these apartment units or just have you know window ones or not you know things lots of decisions like that in other words there's not just one way to make a product there's all kinds of ways you can do things technologically speaking and yet you know how do we know what the most economical way is and that's not something that chemists or physicists can answer that you know they can advise you you need to know facts about engineering and whatever to know this is how you can make cars, but there's lots of leeway. You can make cars different ways and different substitute on the margin. For different. And so how do you know what the economically correct thing to do is you need market prices to, to help guide you. And that's, you know, that's how capitalism works. So how much was that a contributor, the lack of prices, the lack of price signals or price discovery, how much did that contribute to the downfall of uh, communist Russia? Okay, so yeah, so here the context, of course, is Ludwig von Mises famously wrote, um, I guess originally in 1920, an essay on what's now called like the, the socialist calculation problem. And Mises said, uh, you know, put aside issues of incentives, like, the, oh, why would the comrades work hard if everybody gets paid according to his needs or, or something, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs? Why would you exert yourself in that kind of a framework? And also he put aside the issue of, uh, corruption, right? Like if you have this system where the elites are in charge and everybody else has to follow them, you know, power corrupts and they might do bad things. Or how do you how do you watch the watcher? So yeah. Mises said those are all valid concerns. You know, people who would have been injecting the communism up till then. But he said put those aside. Even if everybody you know really wants to do whatever the planners tell them to, and even if the planners really just had the best interest of their people at heart, when it comes to using all the billions of resources at our disposal, you know, all the different factories all over the place, the different iron ore deposits, coal deposits, different types of labor and different skill levels and where they're distributed all over the, how do you know what to do with your economic plan? And he was saying, even ex post, 
it's it's not even like tra- he said, even trial and error doesn't work. It's not like you could go ahead and do it and say, we'll make this many cars, this many diapers, this many houses. We'll put these distribution centers here, here, here. And then afterwards, look back and say, did we do a good job or not? <laughs> he said, you would have no way of knowing without prices because prices allow you to reduce everything to a common denominator in terms of inputs and outputs. So that was his fundamental, you know, critique of socialism. So, um, so you know, especially with the fall of the Soviet Union, a lot of people say, ah, Mises was right. And so here it's, George, I'll just be honest, it's hard to know empirically, you know, was it the calculation problem with that there was a problem or was it the, you know, incentive problem or was it the corruption, pro- you know, so it's a combination of everything. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know empirically what, so I would say we know socialism just can't work as a viable economic system because of what Mises put his finger on. But in terms of like, what would make, why would people abandon their faith in it? Is it that, or is it more like reading about the gulag and realizing like, oh my gosh, these people don't have our interests at heart. These are monsters. You know? So it's, it's, you know, I've heard anecdotally that when the TV show Dallas started being shown in the Soviet union in the eighties, that's really what made them say, look at how rich these Americans are. Our system doesn't work. You know, <laughs> so I don't know if that's true or not. So it's, it's, you know, there is a thing with human beings. If they don't have something to compare it to just because their system's really poor, you know, they, what do they, what do they know? You know, so I don't, I don't know in practice why the Soviet Union collapsed if it was because of the calculation issue, but for sure we can say, even if you could somehow come up with a new socialist man who just wanted to live for others and would do it, you know, joyfully do whatever the planner told them, that wouldn't be enough for socialism to work. It's not just a matter of, oh, people are greedy. You got to take into account human nature. No, even if people were robots, the you know, market prices, profit and loss accounting does a job in the real world. And that you can't have that if the government owns all the resources. Right. Okay. So on that note, what I've tried to think through is if the Federal Reserve as an example, had a central bank digital currency. So the premise there is we all have a bank account with the Fed. So every single transaction occurring in the domestic economy daily goes, they have the access to the data in real time. Mm -hmm. And then if you could combine artificial intelligence with that centralized database of every single transaction, if, if I put Bob Murphy in charge of the, of the central planning uh, socialist utopia society, knowing mm-hmm. what you know about price signals and how important they are, do you think that may be a workaround for the information and the data that we get from prices? Because if they're getting all the transactions in real time and the artificial intelligence is kind of crunching the numbers, so to speak, and then the artificial intelligence that's far smarter than any person. And th- these, they're, these are their words, not mine. Right. Uh, and they could potentially, or the AI could potentially allocate resources as well as the free market can with its price signals. But then we could have more centralized control over the means of production without losing the uh, efficiencies and, and maybe even allocating resources even more efficient than we could before. Okay, so um, in general, you're, you're right. So this is a, a great question. And over the years, yeah, some defenders of socialism have said, yeah, what Mises and Hayek said back in the 20s and 30s was true then, but now with the advent of computers and especially supercomputers, we can just solve it. You know, it's, it's like a, you know, it's a math problem. You just set yeah, up all right. the equations, blah, 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 and, you know, just solve it. And um, so my general response to that is to say that it it's even if it were true that using supercomputers, you could run the economy of 1935 without private property, you know, in the means of production, that doesn't mean that you're more efficient in the economy of the year 2005. Because if you used the price system and property titles, you could then free up the supercomputers to figure out how to build a station on Mars and to cure cancer. You know what I'm saying? So in other words, those supercomputers are going to be doing something. And so if they're getting bogged down solving the problems that right now capitalism or you know market prices solve, then that means they can't be doing something else. So there's an opportunity cost there. So I would say even if it were true on its own terms, we're still poor relative to what we otherwise could have been if we just let market prices do their job. Um, 
but then beyond that, though, I don't even think it's I think that's conceding too much to their case because market prices only quote do their job that I'm talking about in the right institutional context. And so just think about, for example, um, one of the things that you need to know how to do under, in, in, you know, in, like running an economic system is what new products should we introduce and where should we build the factories? So I think some people think it's a mere matter of, oh, we've got factories up and running and we know what their marginal costs are. And if we ramp up output, blah, blah, blah. And it's a simple calculus problem to figure out what's the optimal run size for this load of product to ship out the door. Well, how do we know if we should just shut that factory down? Or why is that factory there and not 100 kilometers west? Mm -hmm. So those types of problems, you realize it's, it comes to like anticipating the future. And so you can't just have, you know what I mean? That, that's not something that's not a math problem. Like there's, a, and so you have, and as they, you know, the high Mises get into this stuff that if you're a central planner, you can't just, you know, like some guy walks in and says, oh, comrades. I have this new plan for making, you know, new tanks or whatever. And look at, we just need to use one tenth the same amount of steel that we use. And he has some crazy blueprint that you don't know. That's nuts. You know what I mean? And so you can't just go with the guy who throws out the biggest numbers because he might be, you know, that might be too grandiose or whatever, or it might be risky, you know, like let's go get icebergs from the North pole and bring them down. And then, you know, we'll sell all that water. And, da, da, da. and, and so there's lots of things like that where it's, it, you know, th I'm, I'm, you can use exaggerated examples that we know are crazy, but sometimes those visionaries who have an idea that everyone else scoffs at turn out to be right. And right. so in a market economy, you just got to convince a few angel investors of your vision. And then if you're right, you make huge profits because you saw things better than other people did. And that's how the profit and loss system works. But if you're wrong, you suffer losses. And so in the, in the, the that's the right system because then the visionaries risk either their money or those they can convince to risk their money so they you know they have skin in the game and yet you know, they get to reap the rewards if they're right and they suffer the losses if they're wrong whereas if it's all socialized you you know you can't just like i say have the taxpayers dollars funding everybody who makes big boasts because then they'll get all frittered away on guys who are crazy or just you know loud mouths and and, and you know braggarts but on the other hand you don't want to just fund the real safe things that are tried and true because then you won't get innovation and so using AI and whatever won't solve that problem, or at least the, the math, it's, it's not just a math problem is what I'm getting at. And so supercomputers per se don't have it. You need to have distributed responsibility and accountability. And that's what you get in a free market system. Profit and loss and Jupiter's creative destruction. Yep. Yeah.